Highway 15. There is an old stretch of highway in the Nevada desert that is out of commission officially, but is still used by locals for shortcut purposes. Old Highway 15 was its number designation. It was decommissioned in 2007 when a brand new, more direct highway was constructed, connecting the northern and southern parts of the state. It was one of the first highways constructed in the state, making it old and in constant need of repairs. Also, with a stretch of highway that old, it, of course, has seen its fair share of carnage and gore, fatalities, accidental and non, murders. It's all happened on Highway 15. The highway has developed quite the reputation as being haunted, not just the most haunted in the state, but in the entire country as well. If you ask locally, they will say that was the real reason the highway was closed. The highway being as old as it is has many ghosts that people have come across and have claimed to have seen. The ghosts spanning many different decades from many walks of life can usually be seen when the sun sets over the desert horizon. There's the woman in white. Funny enough, there always seems to be a lady in white. Many different roads in many different cities and towns have one. The Lady in White on Highway 15, however, is said to have met a horrific demise. One night, in 1963, her car blew a flat tire. She pulled over right away and began to repair it herself. The tire jack must not have been put in properly. It was pitch black out after all. Or maybe the device was faulty. Whatever the case, the tire jack snapped loose and the car smashed back down to the ground, startling her. She fell backwards onto the highway, and as she tried to get up, a speeding car ran over her skull, killing her instantly. Her name was Julie. You might see Julie, the lady in white, if your car gets a flat tire and you're trying to fix it on the side of the road. But don't be afraid. She's only trying to help. Another ghost you might see wandering down the old desert highway is the spirit of little Brody Riley. At least five years of age, he was able to free himself from his car seat and open the back seat door. He fell out of the moving vehicle. And before his parents could act, he was ran over by oncoming traffic. The details too gruesome to repeat. He is said to show up when improper safety procedures are taking place on the road. So whatever you do, keep it safe out there. The most famous ghost out on Highway 15, however, and the ghost that you don't want to have a run-in with, is the ghost of Natalie Hatchery. A woman in her early 20s, she was hitchhiking down the dark desert highway one night in 1973, when she was picked up by who people think to have been the Desert Strangler, a serial killer who claimed multiple victims on old Highway 15 during the time. Her body was found savagely ripped apart on the side of the road, not only by the Desert Strangler's savagery, but also by the desert animals that decided to feast on her flesh. She was left strewn on the side of the road and discarded disrespectfully. It is said that is why she haunts the old highway. It is said she's a protector of young women who break down on the highway. But if you're a man traveling alone, beware. For she does not take kindly to male travelers driving down her highway. It is said men driving past the spot where she was horrifically killed will experience tire blowouts, engine failure, objects hitting their windows, etc. While stranded on the side of the highway, there are accounts of the men being scratched, sudden fainting, chest pains, and extreme sharp pains that emanate through the entire body. 
I can attest first-handedly, for I felt the spectral attack personally as I drove down the highway, alone one dark stormy desert night. So gentlemen, beware of Natalie if you travel alone. And as for everyone else, you best think twice before taking that shortcut. Or do you think you have what it takes to travel down Highway 15 alone? I helped a hitchhiker. I'll start off by saying I'm not a fan of hitchhikers. Never have been, never will be, and have never given a hitchhiker a lift. Except just this once. I was driving cross-country, heading back home after a conference in Edinburgh, and I thought I'd leave at 5 p.m. and get home in time for bed. Fate, however, had different plans. On my last day there, the 13th of October, my car started acting up. I took it to some nearby mechanic, and he said he'd fix it up, but it'd take a few hours. That meant that by the time I got on the motorway, it was already 11 p.m. I'd get home just in time to pass out, I guess. The first couple of hours were pretty normal. As is, there were other cars on the motorway, and when I looked through their windows, I could see people inside, just like me, probably heading home after a long day at work. But as the night grew darker, colder, I began to see less of other cars, and everything else for that matter. The street light seemed to be getting dimmer and would flicker now and then. Mind you, I hadn't traveled this route before, so I had no idea if I was going the right way. The GPS seemed to think so, but it has a history of leading me into dead ends, so I took it with a grain of salt. At one point, there were no street lights at all, and mine was the only car on the road. I couldn't see beyond my headlights, but I kept driving, watching the tiny reflective studs on the road move towards me. It was calming, that sea of darkness, driving along that lonely road, humming something to myself. And that's when the woman stepped out in front of the car, thumbs stuck up. Shit, I whispered, swerving to the right to avoid her. My car just managed to stay on the road and came to a grinding halt. She immediately came up to my window. I rolled it down, more than happy to give her a piece of my mind. What the hell do you think you're doing? You could have been hit, asshole. I'm so sorry, she said, and I noticed her eyes seemed red, as if she'd been crying. I just don't know where I am, and I need to get home. Holy shit, woman, I said, just for the sake of saying something. Please, if you could just please give me a lift, that'd be... How the fuck did you get out here anyway? I'm just walking home. The time got away from me. I didn't realize it was so late. I must have made a wrong turn somewhere because I, I wasn't really listening to her. I'd already decided I would help her out. I could not, in good conscience, leave her out here in the dead of night. Jesus, she must have been no more than 25. Could have been my daughter. Where are you heading? Address? She gave it to me, and I typed it into the GPS. Only 20 minutes away, and practically in the same direction I was going. That settled it. All right, I said, unlocking the doors. Get in the front. Thank you so much, she said, and her smile was bright enough to assure me I'd done the right thing. I started down the road again, which was still deserted. We'd had that whole conversation and not a car had passed by. You don't do this hitchhiking thing often, do you? Once or twice a month. I shook my head. It's not safe, especially for a young girl like you. My eyes alternated between the road and her innocent round face. Get yourself a car. 
Or hell, just get an Uber. None around this area. But cars come through all the time. Hitchhiking is just easier, she said, shrugging her shoulders. Thanks for the advice, though. No good if you don't take it. She laughed. You tried, old man. Who you call an old man? I said, smiling. She reminded me of myself when I was younger. Carefree. And, well, no idea what the hell she was doing. Here is fine, she said a while later. I live down there. She pointed to the right, where the distant lights of a large house could just be seen behind the rows of trees. Sweet place. I'll see you around then. Thanks, mister. I'll let you know if I get a car. I laughed. <laughs> Please do. As she began to walk into the woods, I couldn't help but watch her, wondering why such a young girl lived in the middle of nowhere. She should be out in the city with friends, partying the night away, I thought. She hadn't taken three steps when she turned and looked at me. I turned and started fiddling with the gear stick, not wanting to seem like a creep. Hey, if you've got a long drive ahead of you, you could come inside and I'll give you a coffee, she asked, hands in her pockets to fight the cold, thumbs sticking out. I didn't want to accept the offer, but I'd be kidding myself if I said my eyelids weren't drooping. I left the car on the road, thinking no one would care anyway. Hadn't seen anyone the whole time we'd been driving down here. We reached the house some five minutes after entering the woods. It was even larger than I thought, but I didn't spend long admiring it. I was going to get that coffee and get out of there. I was already running late. I didn't want to sleep through all of Saturday. I took a seat in the kitchen and watched her fiddling with the coffee machine. She seemed hurried and suddenly anxious, continuously glancing at the small clock on the wall. Underneath, there was a piece of paper torn from a notebook that read, What time is it? It's dinner time. In a childlike cursive font, this was illustrated with a drawing of a girl holding a knife and fork above a whole roasted chicken. Sugar? No, thanks. She set my cup down on the table. I took a sip and gestured at the note on the wall. What's the story behind that? I asked, raising my cup to my lips again. That's, uh... She was still standing at the counter, back towards me. That's something my little sister wrote a long time ago. Her voice was unsteady and strained. I wanted to say, what happened? But thought that would just make the situation more uncomfortable. She was very good at drawing, does she still draw? I don't know. What? I said, slowly getting to my feet. She still wasn't looking me in the eye, and I was getting uncomfortable. What do you mean you don't... Oh, I can't do this, she said, more to herself than to me. I noticed she was crying. Oh, God, I can't do this. I approached her. Are you okay? I asked, about to put a hand on her shoulder. She moved away to the corner of the room facing the wall. What's the time? What? What's the time? I glanced at the clock. Nearly two, why? You need to get out of here. Get to your car and floor it. She stopped, clutching at her face. When she spoke again, her voice was a bit deeper. No matter what you hear behind you, don't look back. Go. I headed for the front door at a pace no more than a walk, but I started running when I heard her from the kitchen in a voice that was not hers. I said go. The last word was so loud and deep that my hands trembled as I opened the door. Run. She said, or it said, in that same voice. 
I stepped outside and slammed the door, running through the woods back towards the road. At some point I heard wood splintering behind me, as if the door had been ripped off its hinges. I wanted to look back, but her words were still ringing in my head and forced myself to keep running, sprinting to my car. I could see where I'd left it, headlights slicing through the darkness, but at the same time I could hear something behind me, trampling dead leaves and crashing through any bushes in its way, whereas I had to work my way through it, running around trees and trying to stay on the winding, trodden path. This thing ran in a straight trajectory, even pushing over a few trees. I slammed the car door shut, and it took me three tries to get the key in and start it up. I couldn't hear that thing anymore, but at the same time my own breathing and heartbeat were so loud. I floored it like she told me to, and left that thing in the dust. Not long after, I reached the main motorway again. I've never been happier to see other cars and other people. I still think about that girl, sometimes just as a passing thought, sometimes spending whole nights wondering about her. Wherever she is, I hope she's okay. She seemed like a nice girl. I ran to my dorm room after my final class ended. I opened the door, collected my bags, said goodbye to my roommate and walked to my car. It was winter break and all I could think of was getting the hell out of here and going home to my family. I had no time to waste and if I wanted to make it home on time, I needed to leave right away. By midnight, I was driving through the Arizona desert. My eyelids were getting heavy. Cigarettes and coffee were my friends, but I couldn't stop. I was almost at the state line. Home was nearly there. As I turned the corner, my headlight caught the silhouette of what looked like a female hitchhiker. I drove past her but almost immediately put on the brakes. I know, I know I should never pick up hitchhikers, but it was pitch black out there and it had started to rain. I backed up my car, reached over and opened the passenger side door. A dark haired, what looked to be 5 foot 2, beautiful young woman, bent down and asked if she could get a ride to Las Vegas. I said of course, since I was heading the same way. She put her bag in the back seat, closed the door and sat up front. She thanked me profusely. I said it was no problem. I could see she was shivering from the rain, so I turned on the heater, reached in the back seat and handed her my sweater. I asked her what she was doing out there all alone. She replied that she was on her way home from college for winter break. I told her I was doing the same, which broke the ice, and we began to get to know each other. As she was speaking though, I gave her a once over and noticed she seemed out of place. I don't know how to explain it, her clothes, her mannerism, hell even how she spoke seemed like it was from a different era. I didn't think too hard on it though, she seemed like a sweet girl and I was enjoying her company. After only a few miles we were already becoming fast friends. It's strange but there was something about this girl, we even talked about hanging out during our time off before heading back to school. I even told her I would drive her back to her school on my way back to mine when our winter break was over. After about an hour, I noticed I was getting low on gas. Thankfully, we were now at the state line and there was a gas station right before we crossed over into Nevada. I got out and went to pay for the gas and asked her if she would start pumping. As I got to the door, I turned back and saw her put the hose in the gas tank. I turned around, opened the door and told the cashier, 20 on 5 please, my friend is already pumping it. The cashier looked at me with a smirk on his face and said there is no gas being pumped on 5, looking at me like I was nuts. I handed him the 20 and said what are you talking about, turned and pointed towards the car and said my friend she's right there. Nobody was there. I ran out of the station towards the car but there was no sign of her. She was gone, even her back. A voice behind me said, you met Mary mister. I turned around. It was the cashier. I asked him what he was talking about. He proceeded to ask me if I had just picked her up hitchhiking. I said yes. Then he asked if she wore clothes that seemed from a different era and spoke like she was from a different era as well. I said yes, that's exactly her, but how did you know that? 
That's Mary, he said. Everyone knows her around here. She has haunted this tent of highway for decades now. And always this same time of the year. Mary was killed in 1955. Her body was found about an hour back from where you came, lying on the side of the road with her throat cut. She was on her way back home from Vegas from college for winter break. Wait a minute. You're telling me I give right to a hitchhiking ghost? I said sarcastically. Sure did. You're not the first guy to do it, you know. My god, I thought to myself. I just couldn't believe what I was hearing. I walked towards my car and looked inside the passenger door window to see if there was any trace of her. The only thing that was there was my sweater, lying on the passenger seat. And it was soaking. Wet. Trolling. A hitchhiking ghost. We grew up in a town five minutes north of Philadelphia, but often found ourselves in more rural areas on weekends, especially in the fall, which is wonderful in Pennsylvania. Halloween was always how you'd picture it. Leaves of all colors on the ground, frigid air at night, moonlit quietness all around you. We grew up near where M. Night Shyamalan films his movies signs, the village, etc. So you can imagine things are eerie at times in certain rural locations, especially Halloween. On Halloween 2008, me and a couple friends got stupid drunk in our ridiculous costumes. We played the part well as we all dressed as famous drunk characters from movies and I was Frank the Tank from old school. Halloween came and went as I prepared for November and the holidays. November 1st was like any other Saturday in senior year of high school. Went to work, had a couple beers with some friends, but we called it a fairly early night that night, around midnight. As the brisk November air and the bright moon filled the sky, it was a particularly picturesque fall night in Pennsylvania. A friend and I decided to go on a blunt cruise, in this case a bowl, on a windy back road that consisted of cornfields and not much else. This particular route was perfect for blunt cruising due to the lack of cops, or anyone for that matter. We drove this road often and never really seen anyone or anything much besides deer or some other normal wildlife. As we drove the winding roads, hitting the bowl, and cracking up about dumb shit, we came down this particular stretch of road with cornfields and a church that had a cemetery. Pretty much the only thing for at least a couple of miles or so. All of a sudden, maybe a quarter mile before the cemetery, we saw a man walking along the side of the road. Mind you, it's 1.45 a.m., far from anything, especially a bar, along a dark and desolate road. This man didn't look drunk, as he wasn't stumbling or anything. As high as we were, and as immature as we were at the time, I had the bright idea to tell my friend to stop and see if he wanted a ride, then drive off before he got in the bed of our pickup truck. We pull up to the man who was maybe mid-thirties, early forties, his skin was as pale as the moon, and he looked absolutely lifeless in his eyes. Didn't seem under the influence whatsoever, but he showed us absolutely no emotion or surprise as we pulled up. I rolled down my window and said, Hey, sir. Hey, sir. He just stared at me with his blank look and said nothing. I said, Do you want a ride? He stares blankly at me and walks toward the truck. He was only maybe five feet away from my door, easily within ear range. I said, get in the bed. He stares blankly at me. Get in the bed, I say with a giggly yet assertive inflection. I start to wonder what was wrong with this guy. He didn't say a word. Didn't look under the influence of absolutely anything whatsoever. He's walking in the middle of nowhere at almost 2 a.m. Kids show up telling him to get in the bed of their truck, facing the opposing direction of the way he was walking. And he didn't even care to say 
where he needed to go. He began to walk slowly toward the bed of the truck, and as he was two seconds away from putting his hands on the truck to climb in, I yell, Go! 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 We peel off, leaving him there, standing in the middle of the road, staring blankly as we drive off. Red brake lights faded from his pale face. Of course, we are cracking up over our immature prank cruising away down the road. Mid-gasp for air, I say, Turn around! Turn around! Still laughing, my friend says, Why? What? Why? I said it'd be funny to say to him, Sorry, buddy, we were just kidding. Get in. Then peel away again. We go into another fit of laughter as my friend turns the truck around. We've only driven a hundred yards down the road before turning around, and as we get closer to where we left him, we can't see anything. The road has instantly filled with a thick fog, as if it were summoned. Our mouths dropped as we were baffled by how fog could have just rolled in instantly. Now, as I said, there were only cornfields and a church a quarter mile or so up the road from where we had seen the man. On this particular stretch of road, near the man, it was nothing but open field on either side of the road. The fog had subsided almost instantly, and nobody was there. Our stone laughter became intense fear and bewilderment. We looked all around us, even the bed of the truck, and to our amazement, the man was nowhere to be seen. There was quite literally nowhere that this man could have gone so quickly. No trees or bushes to hide, no houses, nothing. We turned the truck to both sides of the wide open empty acres of field, using the high beams to see if the man had frightened and ran away, but there was nothing. Our ride home was just speculating on what the fuck just happened back there. No, we weren't stoned out of our minds. We weren't on LSD tripping face. We couldn't believe or comprehend what in the hell just happened. We went through and discussed every plausible scenario and concluded that there was no possible way he could have hid or not be seen. We remarked at how the man didn't say anything, was totally sober looking, looked emotionless, didn't specify where he needed to go or what he was even doing out there. His pale face and jet black hair with those hollow eyes are still very prominent in my mind, something I'll never ever be able to explain. I was never a believer in the paranormal, and still I'm skeptical, but I can't explain to you what happened that night. Yes, I know it seems all too fitting. Night after Halloween, late at night near a cemetery, two stoners driving the creepy road in rural Pennsylvania. But I promise you that this all went down, and I'll never be able to explain it. Phantom Hitchhikers Are they a real phenomenon or a widespread hoax? The Vanishing or Phantom Hitchhiker is an urban legend in which people traveling by vehicle meet with or are accompanied by a hitchhiker who subsequently vanishes without explanation, often from a moving vehicle. Public knowledge of the story expanded greatly with the 1981 publication of a non-fiction book, The Vanishing Hitchhiker. In this book, the author suggests that the story can be traced as far back as the 1870s and has recognizable parallels in Korea, Russia, among Chinese Americans, Mormons, and Ozark Mountaineers. Similar stories have been reported for centuries across the world. Variations on the Legend A common variation of the above involves a vanishing hitchhiker departing as would a normal passenger, having left some item in the vehicle or having borrowed a garment for protection against the cold. The vanishing hitchhiker 
may also leave some form of information that encourages the motorist to make subsequent contact. In such accounts of the legend, the garment borrowed is often found draped over a gravestone in a local cemetery. In this or other versions of the urban legend, the unsuspecting motorist makes contact with the family of a deceased person using the information the hitchhiker left behind and finds that the family's description of the deceased matches the passenger the motorist picked up and also finds that they were killed in some unexpected way, usually a car accident, and that the driver's encounter with the vanishing hitchhiker occurred on the anniversary of their death. Other variations reverse the scenario, and that the hitchhiker meets a driver. The hitchhiker later learns that the driver is actually an apparition of a person who died earlier. Studies the first proper study of the story of the vanishing hitchhiker was undertaken by American folklorist Richard Beardsley and Rosalie Hankey, who collected as many accounts as they could and attempted to analyze them. The Beardsley Hankey survey elicited 79 written accounts of encounters with vanishing hitchhikers drawn from across the United States. This study found that most accounts featured someone deceased giving their address to the person who offered them a lift. The second most common was in which an elderly individual would give a warning of impending disaster before vanishing. Rarer, but still recorded more than once, were occurrences of young women borrowing coats or scarves from their driver before getting out of the vehicle the garment would later be found on the headstone of the person. One of their conclusions was that the hitchhiker is, in the majority of cases, female and the lift giver male. Beardsley and Hankey's sample contained 47 young female apparitions, 14 old lady apparitions, and 14 more of an undetermined sort. Paranormal researcher Michael Goss in his book, The Evidence for Phantom Hitchhikers, discovered that many reports of vanishing hitchhikers turn out to be based on folklore and hearsay stories. Goss also examined some cases and attributed them to hallucination of the experiencer. According to Goss, most of the stories are fabricated, folklore creations retold in new settings. Conclusions Few, if any, vanishing hitchhiker stories have been substantiated, but these stories persist and will likely continue to be a phenomenon for years to come. What is your opinion on this? I would like to give a heartfelt thank you to the special friends of the channel for your overwhelming generosity. If you would like to support the channel, the link is below in the description. Also, please send me your stories and poems to duchessofdarkness27 at gmail.com. You can also find me on Instagram at duchess.ofdarkness and Twitter at duchessofdark and two. I want to thank all my listeners for your kindness, your encouragement, and your support. It means the world to me. Thank you for joining me. Until next time.